Thank you, everyone. Um, good morning again, distinguished guests and ladies and gentlemen. It is a great honour and privilege to be speaking in Taiwan with you. As was mentioned earlier, I was given a diagnosis of dementia at the age of 49. So I might just mention the global statistics. There are currently more than 50 million people with dementia in the world. I learned yesterday there are 260,000 people in Taiwan. There is one new diagnosis every three seconds. And there are more, more than 100 types or causes of dementia. Alzheimer's disease making up between 50 and 70% of all dementias. Dementia is a terminal progressive chronic illness and there is currently no cure and no disease-modifying treatment, but there is some treatment for some types of Alzheimer's disease. I'm going to talk a little bit about what it's like with dementia from the inside out. When I was first diagnosed, I attended events, many like this, and was told by people without dementia what I was feeling and what was best for me. And at no time did anyone ever ask me what it was like. So you, you may be wondering, what did happen to my brain because I don't look like I've got dementia. I'm a person with many invisible disabilities currently. So for me, my dementia began with an acquired dyslexia, meaning I couldn't spell simple words anymore and was getting um, numbers mixed up, unable to do maths anymore. Um, I eventually did have some memory loss as well. Um, and it took me two years to get a diagnosis from my neurologist, but for most people under the age of 65, it can take as long as seven years to get a diagnosis. And that's one of the reasons that I um, advocate so strongly for a timely diagnosis for everyone with dementia. Sadly, with the diagnosis of dementia, many people only see the missing pieces. Many people only see the things I can't do anymore. They forget to see there are still a lot of things that I can do. So for me to function like I am functioning, it looks like being a swan on the lake. The swan is calm on the surface, but below the swan is paddling furiously to stay afloat. Inside my mind, I'm paddling furiously even to speak to you today. So what happens when people are first diagnosed is their families are told to start doing for them. And that therefore stops us paddling and makes it seem like we're drowning, drowning from the symptoms of dementia. So a couple of years after being diagnosed, I started thinking about the human rights of dementia. And on, in 1948, the UN Declaration of Human Rights was adopted by the General Assembly of the United Nations and the Convention was and still is meant to protect every single member of civil society in the world, including people with dementia. So 67 years after the Declaration was signed for human rights for all people with all, any sort of disability, the OECD report called Addressing Dementia, the OECD response, they concluded that dementia receives the worst care in the developed world. And that's not your country, but my country, which was a great surprise to me and why I need, felt the need to focus on changing what happens to people with dementia to improve our quality of life and the life of our families. So what can we do to improve dementia care? We have to work really hard to reduce the stigma and the discrimination. And uh, one of our guests earlier talked about the right for younger people to remain employed. And that's a very important component of what we can do. But the research has also been too focused on what I call, and what many people with dementia call, the magic bullet, the cure. We're no closer to a cure for dementia than when I was diagnosed nine years ago that I can see, and I attend a lot of international conferences. There's not enough research going into improving the care 
of the 50 million people already diagnosed with dementia. There's not enough research being done on supporting us as people with disabilities to maintain our independence. There's not enough research being done on reversing or slowing down dementia once you've got dementia. And there's been some novel research coming out of America by Professor Dale Bredesen where he's had a 90% success rate in two pilot projects of significantly slowing or reversing dementia. So why is it in 2017 people with dementia are still being prescribed disengagement or being told to go home and give up? Well, I was a nurse and I started nursing in the 1970s and back then our patients were diagnosed very late in the disease process of dementia. In fact, it was only called senile dementia or pre-senile dementia. It wasn't very well researched back then. But late stage post-diagnostic management was absolutely appropriate. So people who were advancing to the end, near the end of the disease did need to think about their end of life and getting care. But in the last 10 years, the research and clinical community have been pushing very hard for an earlier diagnosis for all people with dementia. So if we're being diagnosed earlier in the disease process, then late stage management is no longer appropriate. So I just took a little bit about this prescribed disengagement and exactly what happened to me was, I was told to go home to get my end of life affairs in order and to get acquainted with aged care, or I think you would call it a nursing home here. Um, and as a nurse, it's the only illness or disease that I know of where you're told to go home and give up, not to fight for your life. So what's the cost of this disenga prescribed disengagement? The cost is a hopelessness for any sense of a future for the person diagnosed and for their families. The cost is also that the person with dementia can assume a sense of being a victim or a sufferer and that further disables and disempowers us and promotes learned helplessness and it also means that our care partner can take over from us so they stop us from paddling or functioning but they're doing it from a place of love not because they're trying to disable us it's what the system is still telling them to do so from from a financial perspective, let's forget about the human cost of being told to just go home and get ready to die and give up living. From an economic perspective, the global dementia community can't afford to keep doing this. We can't afford to keep promoting dependence on our families or our friends and then the government. We need to be finding ways to promote independence and supporting disabilities. And there is, I believe, still very much a systemic and gross underestimation of the capacity of people with dementia. Even people in the later stages of dementia. And I'm going to talk about my experience a little bit as a nurse. I, when I worked, uh, came out of my nurse's training, I worked in a dementia unit in my hometown of Adelaide in South Australia. And there was a lady there who I was told by the other staff not to waste my time on because she couldn't speak. And I took a, I had a real soft spot for this lady. I really liked her. So I used to always try and do her care. And I was in the washroom with her one day and if there are any nurses out there, you know how busy nurses are. We're busy people. Um, I, I, I was, you know, she was taking her time in the washroom and I said to her, Nellie, do you think you could hurry up? And she looked at me with a twinkle in her eye and she said, you could hurry up for yourself. And I said to her, I knew you were in there. Why won't you talk to the other staff? She said to me, I wouldn't waste my time. They treat me as if I'm stupid. I'm just gonna tell another story because um, my husband, Peter, and I have a very unique set of eyes in the field of dementia. 
So I've been a nurse in dementia. I've been a family care partner or carer for Peter's father who had Lewy body dementia and for a young friend who was diagnosed with vascular dementia at the age of 54 and died in a nursing home when he was 57 and he didn't have any family in Australia so I was his legal guardian. But the last few months of my father-in-law's life, um, we used to visit almost every day um, and we were going home one day and Peter said to me, why is it that when you walk in, Dad's face lights up and he talks to you and when I walk in without you, he doesn't say anything? And I said to Peter, it's because you need to slow down and let Dad find, have the time to find his words and to find his thoughts so that he can speak to you. So don't speak for him, don't speak over him, don't try and help him find his words. Word finding, if they're scrambled, is a really difficult thing to do. And I liken word finding or thinking to a stack of china plates. And if we took a, a plate out of the middle of the stack of china plates, the whole stack would come tumbling down. When you do that for a person with dementia, you try and prompt them and help them find their words, it actually makes it harder. So when I was first diagnosed, I did what I was told almost when I lost my driver's license because I failed my driving test. I no longer had a job. And I now realize after becoming aware of my human rights as a person with disabilities and the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, I now realise that I should have been supported to stay at work in the same way that I would have been had I had a stroke and had rehabilitation and been able to go back to work in some capacity. So the financial cost of that to my family meant that I was no longer earning any income the financial cost to my government was that I was no longer paying any taxes. The other financial cost was a huge medical cost. Back in Australia, it's very expensive, a lot of the treatments that we need for dementia. But a lot of the time, I need my husband to take time off of his work to support me with my invisible disabilities. One of the things that was lucky for me is that I was at university as a mature age student. And they simply saw me as Kate Swaffer, a person who wanted to keep living and keep studying. And for all students with disabilities in Australia at least, and I'm thinking probably here too, they would be supported to go to school and then to go to university if that was their wish. So the university treated me in the same way they treated every other person with a disability and they supported me to keep studying. So I finished, after being diagnosed, I finished two undergraduate degrees. I did a Masters of Science in Dementia Care in 2014 with disability support and last year started a PhD, although I think, Lee, you said earlier, I've I'm taken a leave of absence on that for this year because I'm too busy. But because of the disability support, I've been able to keep living a good and productive life. And that's what we need to do for all people with dementia. So what can you do in Taiwan to improve things for people with dementia? Certainly working towards ensuring a more timely diagnosis of dementia for patients. I think, Lee, you told me yesterday 30% of people with dementia, uh, only 30% of people with dementia get a formal diagnosis. In Australia, only between 50 and 60% of people with dementia get a formal diagnosis. In America, only 50% of people with dementia get a formal diagnosis. So it's very clear not enough people are being diagnosed to start with, but they're not being diagnosed early enough. We do need to provide proactive rehabilitation, similar to that of having a stroke or a brain injury. And we do need to provide immediate disability support 
assessment and support, set up strategies to maintain independence for longer. So what else will you need to do in Taiwan and in fact around the world we need to do this? We need to increase education of healthcare professionals. Most of the staff that I've ever had come to support me in my home have done no training on dementia. Not a little bit, zero. Many of the nurses in hospitals have very little dementia training. Many of the postgraduate medical practitioners have very little education in dementia. One of our senior consultant psychiatrists in Australia said that in his 12 years of undergraduate and postgraduate specialist training, he only had six hours of education. And so he went and did an undergraduate course at the University of Tasmania to learn more about dementia. So we need our healthcare professionals desperately to learn more about dementia. We do need to work towards risk reduction or prevention of dementia awareness. And I think that people with dementia would prefer it was called risk reduction because preventing any disease is almost like a miracle. Um, so considering the new emerging novel research that slowing down or reversing dementia is really important. And yesterday when I was in the House of Wisdom um, meeting people there, an email came in while I was doing that with another piece of research, with another researcher, where he's slowing the progression, reversing dementia. Um, so there's a lot of emerging research in that area now. And I think as a country who's working really hard right now about what to do about the prevalence of dementia and what to do to help maintain people maintain independence for longer, that that research is really important for you. And I learned that you are already working hard towards a National Dementia Strategy and Action Plan. Um, and we're encouraging Australia to do that as well. So Taiwan's already been working very hard in the Dementia Friendly Community initiatives. And I see there's a huge potential for these initiatives to bring in collaboration between everybody. So we need governments at the top to buy into improving the lives of people with dementia, to invest in risk reduction strategies, to invest in timely diagnosis and education of healthcare staff. We need Alzheimer's Taiwan to, and I can see them doing it the last two or three days I've been here. It's been incredible to, to watch what you've been doing, Lee Yu. Um, it's the networking of every sector so if Taiwan starts to provide a new pathway of care for people with dementia that includes rehabilitation, that needs to involve occupational therapists at the time of diagnosis because they can do a huge amount to support people to maintain independence. It needs to involve speech pathologists, which is something I had early in my diagnosis, to help people maintain their ability to communicate because without speech pathology early, it's very likely I wouldn't be speaking at all now. If I don't want my speech pathologist near the end of my life when I can't swallow and I'm dying, people with dementia need it early in the disease. So the dementia friendly communities, um, and I met the chair yesterday, chair to be, chairwoman to be of the Dem Taiwan Dementia Working Group, um, but they can and are partnering with people with dementia because people with dementia are the experts of the lived experience of dementia. Yes, the doctors and the nurses are the medical experts and families or carers are the experts of caring and supporting someone with dementia, but those of us diagnosed with it are the experts of what it's like to live with it and what we actually need. And the Dementia Friendly Communities Initiative in Taiwan is already some way towards doing that. And these initiatives will reduce stigma. They will help get rid of the discrimination that many of us currently face. They will ensure that our communities are not just friendly, but that they enable and support us to be active members of our society. 
and uh, there were, I think, four symbols on the slide that I saw yesterday from the EU where you've got dementia-friendly churches and shops um, and clinic, clinic uh, and, and organisation. So as we spread the message to every level of society, then that initiative has the potential as long as we collaborate with everybody, the government at the top, the medical and healthcare professionals, the people living with dementia and the organisations that we need to engage with. As long as everybody's included, the potential for that to change the lived experience for people with dementia, I believe is really high. And I do recommend that Taiwan sets up a dementia working group or advisory group. Scotland were the first country to set up a working group in the year 2002 and that's a group made up completely of people with dementia and it's supported by Alzheimer's Scotland. Europe was the next region to set up a dementia friendly work, uh, dementia working group. Um, I think Australia and Ireland were the next two countries to set up dementia working groups. These groups are made up of people with, pe with dementia and we inform policy, we inform services. Some of us are informing governments and that our families are involved in it as well because they have to support us. So that is a logo that the organisation that I'm a co-founder of um, and the current chair and chief executive officer of um, Dementia Alliance International and um, we've brought Dementia Alliance International to Taiwan this last few days and our main slogan is that people see the person and not the dementia. So when you go home into your communities, if you meet somebody with dementia, see them for who they still are, not for what they've lost or who they're becoming. Because yes, we are changing but so is everybody. So that's a really important slogan to people with dementia and we borrowed from the disability community who started using the nothing about us, without us slogan more than 30 years ago. We borrowed that from them. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about Dementia Alliance International. Why did people with dementia set this group up? Well, we started meeting online and we realised that the slogan of nothing about us without us was just meaningless rhetoric, that conferences weren't including us on their programs, that people weren't asking us to participate in research, that people weren't asking us how we felt or what we wanted. And so eight of us, from, we met in London, some of us, and then we started meeting online. Um, Eight people with dementia from four different countries launched Dementia Alliance International on the 1st of January 2014 and in two years and four months we now have more than three and a half thousand members all living with a diagnosis of dementia representing 39 countries. So this, the membership for Dementia Alliance International, it's a very exclusive club, you have to have dementia. And uh, I've even had some people without dementia say that they wished they had dementia so they could join us. <laughs> because we actually get up to lots of mischief and have a lot of fun. And it's very empowering and enabling to talk to other people with dementia about how to manage the symptoms of your particular dementia. And one of the things that we do um, currently in a number of different time zones is run weekly online support groups for people with dementia. So we don't meet in a meeting room like this. We meet on our computers but we can see each other and we talk to each other about what it's like living with dementia. Um, and you could do that in Taiwan. People with dementia in Taiwan could join Dementia Alliance International even if they don't, can't speak English. Um, we could provide Taiwan Alzheimer's Association with a meeting link so that you could meet each other online if you wished. But we also have monthly cafes where all sorts of people come along and talk to us. 
monthly educational webinars. We have a lot of uh, very distinguished speakers at our monthly webinars that are open to professionals and any member of the public. So for me personally, in some ways, dementia has been my third greatest gift in my life. And the support groups for DAI that I co-host some of them, that's the most important work that I could possibly do because we meet people who are thinking about wanting to die and they've given up living. And within a couple of meetings, people are wanting to get back on to living life again and looking for support so that they can become independent again. So that to me personally is my most important work I've ever done, is to re-empower people with dementia to learn to live well with it, not just go home and give up from it. So I have a dream on my next, oh it's there. Um, I have a lot of dreams actually. Um, I have a dream that there will be a human rights in dementia care um, and that it will include us at every level and include proactive rehabilitation. I put that on the global stage at the World Health Organization's first ministerial conference in dementia in 2015 not thinking for a moment that it would make it to the final call to action, but it made it to the final call to action. And the three demands I made at that day all made it to the final call to action. Um, I do have a dream for a timely diagnosis for everyone. And for that to happen, actually, we also need to reduce the stigma and the fear of dementia. And so I hope that the Dementia Friendly Community Initiatives will go a long way to doing that so people aren't as fearful of going to their doctor. My next dream is that everyone with dementia at the time of diagnosis or very soon after is provided with disability support to help maintain their independence for longer. It may not be a cure but it certainly will give us a better quality of life. People with dementia through Dementia Alliance International globally are uh, asking at the World Health Organization level that we phase out institutional care because we know from research and previous styles of institutional care such as orphanages that people receive worse care in institutional care. My dream is also that all healthcare staff are fully competent in dementia and that the research for risk reduction and improving care is as important and prevalent as the research for cure. Yesterday when I was at the House of Wisdom, I talked a little bit about what it was like having dementia in my relationship with my husband. And we talk about it like it's a threesome. So there's me and there's my wonderful husband Peter and then there's Mr. Dementia. And he reminded me some years ago that it's not my fault that I've got dementia. So to think of dementia as this third person for us has been really helpful because if I get angry at myself for not being able to remember something or not being able to do something, instead of directing that anger back at myself and feeling humiliated or ashamed or worthless or being angry at my husband, I'm angry at dementia, not me and not my husband. So we nicknamed this threesome in our household, the Three Stooges, and you might have to Google who are the Three Stooges, but we've given Mr. Dementia a name and we call him Larry. And, and that means that we remember that it's not my fault I've got dementia. And it helps us find the blessings of dementia in a way and the humor in it because um, yes, it's not like having a birthday party. Dementia is definitely not that much fun some of the time. But actually, if you can let go of the sadness and get back to living, then it's not such a bad place to be. Thank you very much for your time.